All right, here we go. A couple of clients asked about core training. They said after the basic program design video, they wanted to know how you incorporate this into your routine. And what's interesting is you already are incorporating it into your routine when you do the whole body workout. And that kind of feeds into our first one, which is the concept of inconceivable. The second people don't see isolated core exercises like crunches and planks and leg raises, they start freaking out and start thinking, well, where's the core training? And that's what's kind of inconceivable to them is that, I'm going to make a number up, by the way, because people love numbers. It's not science behind this, but it, it might as well be true. I'd say about 80% of your results when it comes to actually core muscle, like building definition, not definition, I should say that, core muscle building development has nothing to do with this last category, your tip of the spear, core isolation movement. So I want to repeat that because that's a big deal. I got more than half a dozen people ask me, what about core training? This shows how ingrained this concept is, that this is where most of your core training occurs. It does not occur as the tip of the spear. It does not occur as the, ice, the relatively isolated movement that you do. Most of your core training is going to come from the integrated patterns that you use. Your squatting, your pushing, your pulling, your lunging, your hinging. Even when you do biceps and triceps, you're using your core to a degree to stabilize your body. And then there are more integrated movements like chops and things like that, which technically are pushes and pulls. You know, you could, you could push the cable up across this way or pull it down that way. Those are more your kind of traditional core exercises. This is the main thing I need you to hit. If you don't get this, you don't get core training. Every time you squat, the only thing that keeps you from slamming your head into the ground when you squat down is your core. When you press, the only thing that allows your body to generate the force you want it to generate, even on a bench press, is your core, or else you'd roll and flop right off the bench. If you're doing a single arm cable press or a single arm cable pull, what keeps you from tearing that flexible rod that is your spine apart as your arms and your legs create death and destruction, it's your core. Let's repeat that again. When you look at the whole body routine and the first thing you say is, where is the core training? That is the biggest paradigm shift you have to have. Yes, there is a need, I want to put it as one of the top three to do isolated ab exercises, but every exercise is a core exercise. Mind blown, that is a big turnaround that most people don't get. Think it again, where's the core training? It's like Prego, it's in there. Don't worry, it's in there. Again, Another example, I'm doing a bicep curl. What keeps me from falling backwards as the weight goes this way is my core. My core, one of its primary jobs is to be able to help you transfer force from the lower body to the upper body. One of its other primary jobs, that's two primary, so I know that's primary, but whatever, is to stabilize your body so your legs and arms can generate maximal force. The reason the core is involved is remember, your spine is a flexible rod. Not much different than this Karen Baylock pool noodle, all right? That, I don't actually name my pool noodles. I don't own a pool. So I actually had to get this from a client. I like to give people credit. It's kind of like the bibliography in a book. So this is a Karen Baylock pool noodle, right? Your spine is a flexible rod. And the only thing that allows this flexible rod here, remember, you remember the hammer of Valenti, all right? Without the core muscles, what is this on blank now? All right, there you go. Without the core muscles, you don't have this. What you have attached to this, this canister here, this arm bone, this leg bone, this shin bone, this power and death generator, what you have attached to that isn't this rigid bar, which if you got hit with this would really hurt. What you have is a pool noodle. So this is fine if you go to pick up a pen off the ground or you're doing a gentle, soft, low velocity cat camel in yoga, or you're just doing you're, you're doing like salsa, right? There's not a ton of, I don't know if that's salsa, I can't dance. But if you're doing any of that stuff, merengue, right? Then this thing actually works. You want this pool noodle. You want to be, you don't want to be like shank, you'd be like a dump truck or like a, like a, like moving like a damn gingerbread man. You need to be loose and flexible because those activities have low levels of force behind them. But if you're trying to not be the pool noodle and be all sexy on the dance floor, you want to be the goddamn hammer and break some stuff. You need the pool noodle to be surrounded by the core muscles so that you're not trying to swing this thing with the noodle. You're trying to swing it with the rigid bar. That is why 80% of your results when it comes to core development 
is going to come from exercises that are not specific core exercises because they have to hold that vital spinal 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 column. I get too excited. Vital spinal spinal column together so the hammer of Valenti can do its job. Again, I said this in the last video. I, this is really wacky, but whatever. You have goat yoga. You have hot yoga. You have dress like a clown yoga. What you don't have is 90 to 100% of one rep backs yoga. Because in order to lift loads like that, you need a rigid bar. And in fact, some of the poses in yoga, which are a little more calisthenic based, your core is held tight. You're not all loosey-goosey. You're not going to hang out very long in a headstand if you're a pool noodle. That's the first part. So if you're pushing, you're pulling, if you're lunging and hinging and squatting, and I don't remember what else I said, elbow flexion and elbow extension, and you're doing it properly, and here's where that comes in, you're already covering core training. And people say, well, how do I know how to incorporate that? It's really simple. For non Strongman competitor, world's strongest man, Magnus Ver, Hammerson, whatever, for non world class bodybuilders, for non power lifters. The process is really simple. All you do, take these two fingers right here, or you take one. Again, I talked about this last video, no problem touching myself. Maybe you do. You could use a marker if that's against your, your covenant with God, all right? But you got the two fingers here, you poke and you squeeze gently against that poke. Now, very, 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 very important. I was once taught by this guy who was this big power lifter guy that no matter what weight was on the bar, you maximally stabilized your body. That just actually hurt, and I'll tell you why. I got hurt doing that. This is not an all or none. This is not a light bulb. Here, I'll give you an example. This is not, this is not, core tension is not a light bulb goes on and off. All right, where my core is tight, my core is loose. Light, tight, loose. My core is really more of a dimmer switch. So it gets dimmer, less tension, more tension, more tension, more tension, core is fully on. This would be a one rep maximal lift. This would be lighter weights, lighter weights, lighter weights, lighter weights, lighter weights, lighter weights. You don't wanna maximally tense the core unless you're lifting a heavy object or else you're going to over pressurize the core and cause an equal and opposite reaction. There's nothing to react. How do I put this? There's nothing to balance out that massive amount of core tension. So what you get in the in the end, what you get in the, the result is you wind up getting forces that are imbalanced. And that's where you want the core. You want a balance of forces coming from a 360 degree angle to stabilize that pool noodle, to turn it into the Baylock pool noodle, to turn it into the handle of the hammer of Valenti. But again, it is a, uh, Chris Duffin talks about it, it's like a dial, right? You dial up the exact amount of core tension you need. So I don't want you squeezing so hard that you poop your pants. First off, I don't want you pooping your pants. Second off, when you do it, give it a poke, give it a squeeze. But what most of my clients are lifting, and you, a lot of you aren't doing, I, I would give you special instruction if you're lifting very heavy weights. Give it a poke, give it a squeeze, enough. Here's the, here's the way you do it practical. Hey, you know you don't poop and you don't, you don't blow the dimmer switch. Poke, squeeze, and it should gently change the sound of your voice. You should not be able to have a normal conversation like this. If you can have a normal conversation, the tension isn't great enough. If you can't speak it, you're creating too much tension. If the core tension is so great, you can't speak you're more than likely overpressurizing the core. And what I did was I used 500 pounds of core pressure to lift a 135 pound bar because Mr. Thick Wrists and Elephant Calves told me that every muscle must be stabilized at maximum amount on every set. And that hurt me. So maybe it works for him and his giant Sopranos like neck, but for me, it caused back injury. Again, core, core tension is a, uh, Chris Dovin, a dial, it's not an on-off switch. It's a dimmer, it's not an on-off switch. You, you stabilize the core to the degree you need it in the movement and the load you're lifting. And for most of my clients, the practical, long-winded shank take-home is poke, squeeze enough to change the tension of your voice to a degree, but not That actually hurt my back because it was creating too much tension and damage was done a long time ago. So that's the first thing you want to do. 
Use every exercise as a core exercise. And I gave you the simple technique how to do that. The second thing you want to do is you want to realize the concept of nature's death cloak. Where nature's death cloak comes from is from actually the widescreen version of the movie Dodgeball. And when you go into white good, and this actually turned, I was actually turned on to this by the person who was responsible for making these. And only in the movie theater or widescreen version can you see these, they're tapestries and they're hanging from the ceiling of White Goodman's gym and dodgeball. And they put so much work into these, but unfortunately, if you watch it on cable, you can't see them. And there are these tapestries, these like crazy fitness sayings. And one of the sayings is White Goodman's face, you know, like doing this, and it says fat is nature's death cloak. Now, the problem with that is, is fat really isn't nature's death cloak. Believe it or not, fat is actually nature's survival cloak because we didn't always have fast food and five guys, which I guess it's fast food, so it's the same thing. The problem with us is we have, let's say this, too much fat is nature's death cloak. There's no natural balance in our system. Food is too easy to get to and movement is too minimized. That is what we call the obesogenic environment. Tasty, high fat, high sugar food, high caloric density food is too available and movement is too unavailable. So what we get is an accumulation of fat and then fat goes from being nature's survival cloak to nature's death cloak. The reason why this is relevant to core training is most people do, my back is actually killing me from that over pressurization, but whatever, I'll stretch it out later. Most people do all types of these, like I, I saw a video once, it was 20 minutes of nothing but core. And it was this like sexy aerobics person dressed up in spandex. And this person was doing like all these like variations of crunches and like bands on the ankles and stuff like this. It was like, ugh, and ugh with the medicine ball. And all I'm picturing is, why the frig are you doing 20 minutes of abs? Unless you're not doing any pushing, pulling, lunging, twisting, whatever. This person's arms were way too toned to not be doing that. But again, this goes into this whole concept. What is the tip of the spear, the core isolation, where all of a sudden becomes the whole goddamn kit and caboodle. I don't even know what the hell that means. I just know it's what it's supposed to mean. Kit and caboodle. Everything becomes the tip. Everything, instead of being the tip of the spear, it becomes everything. And the problem with it is I think the reason why that's got such a powerful, powerful hold on people, why these 20 minutes of isolated ab exercises it just first off, the fitness field takes total advantage of this. This video had thousands and thousands of more hits. One, because the person doing it was way better looking than I am, and they were wearing spandex. I feel like a slut just wearing sleeveless shirts, right? So I'm not a big fan of, 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 of using my body to sell fitness. I don't know. I may have went too far with that last one, whatever. The fitness industry feeds into this. They create all these core and ab videos to feed into the idea that if you just do enough ab training, that somehow you'll have defined abs. And here's the problem with that. There, there's two major technical problems with that. All right, this is my arm. Right, I'll show you this one because it's, right, no, I'm actually going to show you it's better in the light. This is my arm. So I got a nice little bump here, right? That's my that's my bicep. It's a little, little you're like, right, look, I'm not Robbie Robinson with the triple-headed bicep, all right? It's a bicep. It's, it, it's got round, it's got shape to it, all right? I'm happy with it. That's my bicep. Now, same bicep, but now I'm going to put a coat on, okay? Now I'm going to flex my bicep. What happened to that nice little round definition that I had? Did it disappear? No, it's still there. It's just hidden underneath the coat. And no matter how many bicep curls I do, no matter how shapely and beautiful my bicep becomes, you will never see it because it's buried underneath this coat. In the human body, it's not a coat, it's a layer of fat. So no matter how many angles of bicep I do, no matter how many sexy aerobic person abs I do for 20 minutes straight, if you have the coat on, nobody's going to be able to see the muscle. It's the tip of the spear. It's not the whole spear. So besides realizing that most core training is incorporated in other exercises anyway, you can't see the muscles you build unless you drop body fat.
and people always say to me, well, why did, you know, there's always, like, well, people always ask this. I think maybe two people have asked this in 20 years, but whatever. People ask me once why bodybuilders shave or why they shave down. Because now, if you combine the concept of a coat plus body hair, right, now nobody can see anything. So you just took your awesome muscle definition. Watch this jacket's is going to get stuck on me. I'm going to do the rest of the damn, damn video dressed like a Wookiee. All right. Now, all of a sudden, you've got body fat, so no one can see your definition here, and now you're covered in hair. So now you're doubly undefined. So that's a side note. Why I really just wanted to show off my Chewbacca coat, and that's doubly why bodybuilders shave down. Why they get so lean and they shave down is so you can actually see their muscles, but it's stuck. This is finished. I knew this was going to happen. I knew the Chewbacca coat. Oh, there it goes. Cool. I could have done the rest of the video just like this, by the way, and I actually probably would have enjoyed it. I'm gonna do my Chewbacca voice really quick. I've wanted to do this on film forever and since this is my channel, I can do whatever I want, right? Lily, I'm trying to do a Chewbacca voice. I can't do it now, I'm falling under the pressure. That definitely sounds like a, it sounds like a lamb being led to slaughter. That was not a very good Chewbacca voice, whatever. So now you know the problem. Now here's the deal. They may say, well, I do a lot of core training. I do 45 minutes three days a week. Here's the problem with that. Alpha and beta. This has nothing to do with the roided up sorority from Revenge of the Nerds. It has nothing to do with the whisperers from, what was that, from The Walking Dead. Alpha and beta happen to be the type of receptor sites that are in fat cells. And different regions of, well, let me explain what this is. I'm not going to go into like very big detail of this, but the beta receptors on the fat cells are kind of like the liberals. They're kind of like the hippies. They want to share everything, man. So if you've got body fat, they want to give it away. The alphas are kind of like the, the right-wing conservatives. They, what, what's mine is mine, and I'm giving you nothing. <laughs> what? What's the matter? I'm in the middle of the lecture. I can't stop. I'm loud. You've, known, you've been living with me for 12 years. You know how loud I am. Let me finish this and then we'll go have a good time. So what you have is the alpha and beta receptors. Well, if you ever ask yourself, how come when you diet your face gets really lean, but if you're a guy you still have belly fat, and if you're a woman you get six pack abs, but you still have fat on your hips? This is your answer right here. These, these alphas, they don't, they don't give away what they got very easy, and there's a reason for that. If, if every one of your fat cells was a beta man, if they were hippies, man, it's, it's free, man, give it all away, you'd starve to death. At least for most of our human history, you'd starve to death. Nowadays, I doubt that's much of a chance of that ever happening. You'd starve to death. So you need these alpha cells, these ones that are less likely to give away their fat. Well, guess what if you're a guy where they are? Most of the alpha receptor sites on the fat cells tend to be in the abdominal area. Right? That's why I think it's the, the philosopher Nietzsche, if I'm saying that right, said something along the lines of the only thing that keeps man from believing he's a god is his belly. Nietzsche understood the concept of alpha and beta fat cell receptors, whether he knew it or not. These don't even release fat in famines for the most part. At the very end, they will. These things are stubborn. They don't want to share anything with anybody. What's mine is mine, go get your own, is basically the alpha philosophy to fat economy. So the idea that you're going to do a bunch of ab exercises and in an area riddled, riddled with alpha receptor sites on those fat cells, it's not going to work. And that nature's death cloak that coat that you have, it's going to laugh at your ab training. It's, it's not going to work. You know, if your abs are filled with a bunch of beta cells, like typically found in females, some females, I should say, but then all of a sudden you're doing all these like bird dogs and these band things and all these like cool glute things but by the fitness influencer, who, by the way, I know for a fact, squats, lunges, and hinges two to three days a week, I'm going to show how I really feel about this. But then goes on the video and does it, by the way, like in sweatpants. 
and, and regular shorts, and then the video, they do all these goofy isolation movements that have nothing to do with why their glutes are developed the way they are. For you and your hips, you've got these alpha cell, these alpha receptors, which actually only really get access during pregnancy because they're there in the first place to be there as an easy, the, the weight in your hips is there to be as an easy source of fuel for nursing. So you really have to get pregnant in order to be able to, well, I should, I'm getting a lot outrageous here, but you get the point. The alpha cells are not going to give their fat up for much of anything, let alone for an ab or a hip thigh and butt blaster routine. The only way you're going to get rid of major death cloak is by being in a prolonged caloric deficit over a long period of time. And even then, I've met people who have gotten scary lean who still have fat on their midsection in men. And I've met women who get scary lean to the point where they lose their period and they still have fat on their thighs and hips. That's how powerful the alpha, the alpha receptors are on those fat cells. They do not, they will hire every accountant and lawyer and tax shelter in the Cayman Islands to protect what they have. They are not giving it up just because the betas hold the sign and say, share the wealth, man. They don't care. Don't go vacation. Don't go on a vacation. Let someone else deal with it. Because they are not going to let you get rid of this unless they have a really damn good reason. So that's the second part of it. You got the fact that most people completely don't understand core training because they don't understand that every exercise is a core exercise, that isolation work is, is third on the totem pole. They, they don't understand no matter how much core work they do, too much fat obscures whatever muscle. You got the most beautifully defined muscles ever, but if you got the coat over them, no one's going to see them. And then the third one is the tip of the spear. This is the actual isolated core work. Now, this video has gone, oh my God, only 21 minutes. I might get this done in four minutes because I'm not actually going to do an ab routine. That'll be a whole other video where I'll be like, all right, here's what Shank does to keep his back from hurting. This is the tip of the spear stuff. When you do isolated core work, here's what you need to know. Let's go A, B, C. You got sagittal, frontal, and transverse. And then you have anti, and we'll call it pro. I don't even know if that's the right use of the word, but whatever. So when you are doing the tip of the spear, the isolated core work, you want to make sure that you do exercises that work in what's known as the sagittal, or sagittal, which is for arrow, right? This plane of motion. This would be your crunches, your planks, your leg raises. You want to make sure you do something for the frontal plane, which would be your side planks, um, your side flexions. If you're trying to build a bigger, thicker waist because you're a combat or strength force sport athlete, a loaded side bend or a weighted carry would be the static version. I'll get to that in a second. This would be the dynamic version of it. And transverse would be anything that takes you through this plane. So sagittal, frontal, transverse. This would be your rotations, your anti-rotations, your bird dogs. Does that leg and arm go up? The reason why you don't do this is because you have a core to anti-rotate you. When you do a plank, the reason why your body doesn't go this way or this way is you have a core to anti-flex and extend you. Anti-flex, anti-extend, boom. And when you try to go side to side, I want to stabilize, say, for example, in a split squat. If I want to do a split squat and not wind up like Fred Flintstone's car after they put that big stake on top of it, this is my lateral core, my inner outer thigh. That's what helps stabilize me in this position or in the case of the dynamic motion, move the weight this way. So when you're designing a complete tip of the spear core, quote unquote, isolation routine, it's really not isolation, you get the point. You wanna make sure you work and exercise through all three of these planes. Now the question I get a lot of times from people is, do I want, and there's a lot of thing about this, about how you want your core exercises to be anti-core exercises. And that doesn't mean go eat a cheeseburger and a milkshake. What anti-core means is, if sagittal motion is this way, do you want to train the core muscles for things like sit-ups and crunches to create a core that dynamically moves? Or do you want to use planks and things like that to prevent movement? Here's why the latter became very popular. It should be very popular. I use it all the time because of my back, the arthritis in my spine. So what happens is, from lifting like an idiot for too long, what happens is, you actually stiffen the core. By the way, every exercise that's a core exercise works every core muscle just to varying degrees. So what you do is you stiffen the abdominal wall. Now, why is this important? 
Because now all of a sudden, I'm the hammer of Valenti. I'm not the pool noodle anymore. I can generate tons of force in my arms and legs because it's sitting on the stable base that is a buttress stabilized two finger poke and squeeze changing the voice spine. So that's where this became very hot because when you have people that have issues with instability in their spine, their spine moves too much, especially under load where they can lose the bar. They can not generate as much force just watch an NFL game played in the rain. And you'll see when even the world's most powerful athletes try to generate force on unstable surfaces, they lose a ton of their power. Well, if your core is not stiff, it's not buttressed and braced, you might as well be playing football on really, really wet grass. Because your chest, which is bench pressing, and your shoulders, which are shoulder pressing, and your squats, your, your quads, which are squatting, and your, your glutes, which are hinging, and your squats also use your glutes, they're basically playing football on, on wet grass if you're not stabilizing your core. So there's a lot of applications, both for people who have back problems, there's a lot of applications for people who are trying to maximize performance in certain sports. The problem with a lot of this anti-core training is, especially if you're a person with a healthy back and you need to use these core patterns, people have literally become so paranoid about moving their spine that they, they've turned into the, the gingerbread men, they become really stiff. So the rule I use with my clients, and I don't want to get into training javelin throwers or martial artists who do actually create some loaded spinal movement. Well, again, most of it, they're buttressed and they're moving through their arms and legs to generate force. I don't train any javelin throwers. I don't train any martial artists. I'm not going to get into that. For my clients, what I want you to understand is whenever we're generating force, lifting weights, I want you to use the anti-flexion extension, anti-side to side, and anti-rotation patterns. I want you to buttress that, that Baylock pool noodle and turn it into the handle of the hammer of Valenti to protect your spine and maximize results to generate force. Right? Again, generate force, can't play football on wet grass very well. That's what you do when you stabilize your core. You're allowing your arms and your legs to do everything. So I want to do crunches where we're minimizing any motion in the low back by either putting a hand or a towel or a block under our back and just creating small crunches here. I want to do planks to help you stabilize in this position. I want to do side holds, side planks to help you stabilize in this. I want to make sure when we're split squatting, we don't look like we're, we're Wang Chung in tonight. I need you to stabilize and buttress that core. Then when you're not under heavy loads, and under high forces. I want you to use things like cat camels, the yoga movements. I want you to use that to help lubricate the joints of your spine. I want you to use that whenever you're lifting light loads and your back's not bothering you so that these areas of your spine don't forget what they're doing. I've met a lot of guys who've been powerlifters for a very long time and a lot of them can barely bend over to touch their toes. And that's not a negative on them. The real reason why they can lift the weights they can lift is because they can buttress that core so stiffly. I've also met Olympic weightlifters and people like that who can, who can stick their nose on their toes. So we're not, again, we're not talking about world-class athletes here. Just remember is when you're doing low, low again, when you're not in back pain, when your back pain is all other animal, you shouldn't be talking about where, look, I wear, like, can you see these? The 1970s shorts for a living. I, I, I'm not going to give people advice when they're in pain. But when we're lifting heavy weights, we anti. We buttress, we don't rotate, we don't side bend, we don't flex and extend. We do planks, we do side planks, we do bird dogs, we do limited range of motion crunches, we do, I'll get into when I do my exercise, side flexion holds on the ball, we do pay off presses, you always see my clients do this, less anti-rotation exercise. That, that's how I want you to divide into, yes, we do core exercises in the sagittal, frontal, and transverse plane, but because we're trying to train you to stabilize your core, most of the stuff we do involves buttressing here and moving the limbs. Now, right now, I'm rambling a little bit. My dog, dogs have been very patiently while he's sleeping right now. So, in summation, the fact I answered this question in the first place kind of showed that there's a big problem out there, that we don't understand that 80% of our core training has nothing to do with isolated core work. Understand that if you're wearing nature's death cloak, 
no matter how much ab training you do, no matter how defined you are, no matter how beautiful your bicep is, the second that coat goes on, nobody can see your muscle definition. And if you think you're going to use exercise like that to burn the fat off, remember, men in your core and women in your glutes, these bad boys, these receptor sites on the fat cells that determine whether or not you're going to even access that fat in the first place. And the men, the, most men, some women, the belly is rich in these, and in with most, some women, most women, and some men, the hips and glutes are rich in these. No matter how fat I get, I never can put fat on my butt. That's why I can't do a spin class. I even tried those padded seats. I literally have genetics where I can't put any fat. I can have a belly like Santa Claus, Jewish Santa Claus, and I'd still have a butt that's too fat-free to sit on a spin bike. It's just, it's just the way, that's how powerful this is. And that's why your ab sculpting routine, unless it involves throwing food out, is not going to make you lose any fat. Again, for million, millions of year old mechanism to help you survive starvation is not going to be impressed with your, your 20 minute of abs YouTube video. It, it, it's it's going to happen. And then we got the tip of the spear. So if you do do that YouTube video, just make sure it has exercises that work sagittal, frontal, transverse, and also understand what you're training for. If you have back issues or you're training for maximal carryover to your squatting, your lunging, your hinging, your pushing, and your pulling, you want to make sure some, if not most, of those core exercises involve preventing movements in these places. And if you have back issues or you're just, I shouldn't have said this, even if you're just a regular, normal, healthy person, you do want to, you do, want to do motions that work you through these planes, just minimize the amount of force. Remember, the Baylock pool noodle, not designed for force. If I try to put force down through the Baylock pool noodle, it's going to break. If I try to put force down through the hammer of Valenti, maybe you can see this. No matter how hard I push here, hammer Valenti doesn't bend and it doesn't break because it is literally that pool noodle transformed into a rigid bar by all the core muscles that surround it. That's where your anti-rotation, anti-flexion, anti-extension training comes in. It turns this spine that was a pool noodle into a rigid bar. So that's it. Um, I, I think I've said enough. I maybe in some parts of this said too much. And, but we do this all live. I, I want to thank Frankie and Lily for being very quiet during all this. Lily had one little outburst and then she went to sleep. So uh, that's it. Thank you very much and I'll see you later.